So this is the first session for this year where we're going to look at in turn each of the areas of knowledge that you have identified that you are missing in your photographic experience. So the first thing that you all highlighted was removing content defects. So what do we mean by this? So we're going to have a look um, at what is a content defect and this is not an exposure defect. Um, it's something in the pixels in your image that you consider to be not quite right. We'll also have a look at what sort of fixes are available and all the different ways we can fix content defects and when is the best time to fix it. Uh, hopefully we'll get through all of that in this session and um, next time we'll go on and have a look at some more advanced ways of fixing. So in last year we covered all aspects of composition and what made good composition within an image. And a couple of the things that we identified that contributed to good composition was a good balance in the image. And often when you're taking images, you take an image that when you look at it, it's just wrong and it's not balanced correctly. And so if you don't know what I mean, if you're a newcomer in um, this year's course, go back and have a look at the session on balance. And we all know when something's just not quite right. And so we're going to have a look at how to fix balance in images. Uh, the other thing that we identified within composition is when you're framing something up to try and get rid of any distractions. And so we'll have a look at what are distractions in images and how do we get rid of them. And anything that negatively impacts the visual path. We, we looked at the concept in good composition of providing a coherent visual path for the viewer to look through an image and follow the line of thought that you had of where you want them to look. And anything that takes the viewer outside that path, like something right distracting on the edge of frame, then that is a content defect. So first of all, we're going to have a look at things that unbalance an image. And the most obvious thing is uh, when we have crooked horizons and crooked buildings. And so I'm going to talk about each of these defects and then we're going to go into Lightroom and just have a look at ways that we can fix these things. But you can see it's a lovely um, picture of a cliff and, and water, but whilst that horizon is looking like that, it really unbalances a viewer. They It makes them feel uneasy. And putting things on diagonals like this is often a way that we provide energy in a um, an image. And also unbalancing the viewer sometimes is a way of giving them a narrative. But in case of this seascape, it's obviously an accident, so it needs to be fixed. And um, this is a crooked building. And it's not that it's crooked because you can see that red line on the right hand side is perfectly vertical and it's parallel to the windows. This is what we call lens distortion and you get it with a wide angle lens. And so when we go into um, editing software to fix lens distortion, we're not, um, some people find it unethical to change images. All this is doing is fixing a technical fault in our camera. Buildings aren't crooked in the front and straight at the back, so we need to fix that. Cropping is one of the ways that we can fix balance. And you can see this, this picture of the rows. Um, it, I composed it to fit within the frame, but obviously the framing of this needed to be more a square than a uh, landscape aspect ratio. So in even taking it, I recognised the fact that I would need to crop this appropriately. So I made sure the left-hand side was right and then just uh, crop the right-hand side. So often with your images, if you think like this one, oh, it just doesn't look balanced. It's right in the middle, but it doesn't look balanced. It actually looks better when that uh, centre of the petals is, is on the rule of thirds and it's a square crop. Often flowers look really good in square crops. The other thing that um, in photography, if something's not contributing to the story, get it out. And so whenever you're looking at an image and thinking about cropping it, 
that whole right hand third is not contributing to that story at all. And by getting it out, it allows the viewer to focus on the narrative, which is the lovely, lovely petal formations around the center of that flower. And you'll notice I also got rid of some defects on the petals, which is our spot removal, which we'll have a look at later. Again, um, you can see this image is so much better for the crop, but in terms of cropping in camera, I couldn't do it. It was a long way away. It was one that I took at Rip and Lee when we were there. And th this was taken with a very long lens and quite a distance. But when I got the photo back, yes, I knew I had to crop it when I was actually taking it. But you can see all those distracting elements of those bright lights around the sides of that image detract the, the viewer from the story. And so anything that detracts the viewer, try and get it out of the image. And that may be via spot removal or cloning, or in this case, I could easily do it just by cropping. And you can see the image down below is a much more interesting image. Ideally, I crop in camera. And if I'd been able to get close enough to this, um, I would have cropped in camera. But um, sometimes I don't get that opportunity. So that was about unbalancing the image. We'll now have a look at some of the defects that can distract the viewer. So what sort of things will distract the viewer? Well, clutter, uh, and I've mentioned this to you many, many times, is some of the most engaging images are ones that are simple. The story is simple, the narrative is simple, and it allows the viewer to relax in the image. Whereas when there's clutter, they're never quite sure are the, those things on the side there, are they meant to be part of the image or am I meant to be ignoring them? And it's it's like being in a cluttered room. It's not restful for the viewer. So anything that's not in the story, get it out. Um, and this is particularly relevant to border distractions. Ideally, anything on the border is part of the story and is on the border for a reason that if you've got odd distractions sitting right on the border, it drags the viewer's eye to the border and then out of the image. And they don't stay engaged with your image. So cropping is an ideal way to get rid of border distractions, but sometimes you don't want to crop because the uh, image will then become unbalanced. So you may need to get rid of those using some of the, the clone and uh, heel tools that we'll be looking at. The other things that are distractions are like in the rose that we had, where it had insect bites on its petals. And it was a beautifully composed rose. It was absolutely stunning. But those insect bites were really distracting. So there's some of the flaws that you can easily remove from an image to take it from being a very ordinary image to something that's really beautiful. The other thing is the um, tonal distractions. And in that big magnolia, the white magnolia flower, you could see the tonal distractions in the background of those bright highlights on the leaves. And instead of burying the viewer's eye in the centre of that big magnolia, which is where you wanted their eye to go, they would, I would jump off onto those bright lights on the leaves. And so that's another reason to get rid of them, to just keep the viewer into the image that you want them to look at. The other thing that I constantly remind you of is be very aware in the background of anything that is bright red, bright yellow or bright blue, because the eye will immediately go there. And so you're wanting them to have a look, look at the centre of the petals of a particular flower. And that's why you took the image. But in the back is a man with a red T-shirt. Their eye will immediately go there. They won't look at the flower. So whenever you're framing up, the first thing is to make sure the man with the red, red T-shirt keeps walking. Or if it's a red flower and there's not a lot you can do about it, then you'll have to do something about it in editing to try and desaturate it or clone it or heal it out so that that way the eye isn't detracted. I know when I first came to photography, I thought of editing as being a flaw in my photography. And I sort of still think that in a way and we're going to talk about that at the end of this um, but sometimes you have a fantastic image and there is absolutely nothing you could have done in shooting to remove those flaws so things like the rose nothing I could do about those insect bites they were there I either didn't take the photo or I did take it 
and just accept that later I can change that from being an ordinary image to something that I'd really want to look at just by putting a few edits in it. So this is where we've got clutter in an image and this was um, a scene in Hobart and I just love the colours. Everybody in the image contributed to something and the colours were amazing. But the clutter is these people on the side here and they just needed to be removed and also this signage here. And the moment there is any writing in an image, the viewer's eye will go directly to the writing. So if there's any writing, get it out. We don't mind the coffee being there because it's part of the story. The other highlight here, this bright area at the top, allows the viewer's eye to go from the wonderful scene in front of the coffee shop straight out of the image because it's bright and it's light. So it's another reason to crop off the top. So just by a very simple crop, nothing else much done to this image apart from crop it, and it becomes a really interesting tableau and each person contributing to the story. The other way that we fix flaws is um, things that we can't control. So this was a photo I took at the boat sheds last week. And you can see in the water, there is some leaves that have fallen in the water and some bright spots. These are our tonal bright spots that I was talking about and flaws in the image that it just detracts. I love the fact that these look like two fish looking at each other. So it's got an abstract perspective as well. Love the color tones in it. But while it had these spots in there, that's where your eyes go. So we'll have a look at how to very quickly and easily get rid of spots like that. And the other times, um, you know, I love this as a photo I took in Hobart last year. And I love the symmetry here of these lights and the building. And I love the complementary colours of the blue and the yellow. But this was a mast from a boat in front of this building. And it's just distracting. So we'll have a look at how you get rid of something like that. The common... Uh, flaws within images are sensor spots and this is from a, a dust on your sensor and a dirty sensor and the, they show up particularly when you're using a uh, wide aperture uh, and when you're shooting the sky and they come up as little dirty spots so you see these little dirty spots in your image if you've got those dirty spots in your sky they're coming from your sensor and your sensor needs cleaning the first time I ever got one, I thought I'd photographed a flying saucer. Um, <laughs> it was only when it was in every single image, I thought maybe it's not a flying saucer. Um, but there's something that you need to get rid of because they are distracting, particularly in a white cloud having a big grey spot in it. Sometimes um, I talked about colour distractions of bright red, bright yellow and bright blue. Well, and, and bright um, light tones. This was a photo I took of this guy. Um, he was, it, it's a genuine photo of a guy in a pub, um, a country pub. It, he just had the most lovely smile and he was just such a nice guy. So I asked him if I could take a photo, but we were in the pub and I had all sorts of things going on in background. So I used a really uh, wide aperture to give me a very narrow depth of field to blur the background but I couldn't blur out this lighting feature it was some sort of sign in the background it just stayed bright and stayed colorful so one of the ways that we can um, do this is to just select the background and darken the whole thing down and that's all I did here and you can see these distracting spots and tonal contrasts in the background how how they take your eye off him. Whereas when you're just looking at this, you don't go to the background, you just stay focused on him. So there's some very easy ways that we can get rid of background distractions. And so these are the fixes that are available to us to make these changes. And so we'll go into each of them. Um, first of all, have a look at crop cropping and transform. First of all, we'll have a look at how to fix an image um, when it's crooked and 
how to transform it and um, straighten it. So I'm using Lightroom because Lightroom is um, has the best editing software and I can highly recommend you using it as a editing tool. Uh, its strength is in its cataloging capability. I've got nearly a quarter of a million photographs catalogued in here. I could not find them if I didn't have something like Lightroom to do it. But the techniques I'll be using here are fairly standard across all editing programs. And one of the most standard things is your crop tool, which is this tool and it's a fairly common um, icon. And this little concept of a straighten tool is again across a lot of different um, editing software where you just pick up a ruler and you just put it across the horizon like this and let go. And if you say constrain the crop to image to the image, you get it straight. Now we're going to go back there again and I'll ask it to reset. Sometimes auto will work. Um, there's a lot of smarts now in editing software. And if you select auto, it couldn't work on this one. It probably needs some verticals. But try auto if you've got um, a lot of verticals in the image and it will work. Now, the other option we have is transform. And this is what's really good for crooked buildings. And we call this effect a, a keystoning effect. So if we go down to the transform option down the bottom, and we can either use auto, and sometimes that will work, so we'll try auto on it. Yeah, it's pretty good, but it's ended up making it lean forward. So I don't really like that, so I'm going to turn auto off. And I'm going to try the guided version. So if I click on guided, it's just done it for me. Usually it asks me to um, put the guides in, but it's done it for me. So um, the guides, I'm going to turn it off. I'll go back to the guides. I don't know why it's put the guides in. It usually doesn't. And the guides allow you to just put guides in to straighten it, but it's automatically done it for me. But you can see it, it stops the user being, or the viewer being unbalanced by seeing crooked buildings. The back's straight, the front's crooked. Why? Buildings don't look like that. So it just allows you to very quickly fix them up. So we're now going to have a look at some of the other um, tools that we've got. Go down to here. So we'll have a look at the um, spot removal for this one. Uh, first of all, the cropping. We can just crop it in very quickly. And the cropping tool allows you to put an overlay. By pressing O, you can see the different overlays on it. And these overlays give you a guide on where that crop should actually go. So have a look at the edges and the top and just by hitting O it will show you and that um, golden uh, spiral that we looked at last year in composition you can see that is the best composition by having that center of that spiral right in that center of that rose but now we need to have a look at how can we get rid of those spots and this is the healing tool here and again it's a very common icon across most uh, image editing software. So within Lightroom, we have three different ways we can heal. We can use the Band-Aid brush or healing spot healing brush, um, or just the healing brush it's called, but it's always got that Band-Aid on it. And we can just reduce the size of the brush. We can either do that here or just by using the brackets. And you can just mark it. And you can see that it's fixed it up. So the healing brush is pretty good. I like it instead of the clone. The clone tool, sometimes the healing brush um, doesn't work as effectively as clone because the healing brush will take the um, 
it automatically decides where it's going to use. Oh, sorry, I was actually using remove at that point. So we'll try the healing brush here. See that it's actually used the healing brush here. It's better off to use the remove tool because the remove actually removed it. So if you can't get one of the tools to work, try another one. So, oh, sorry, turn that one back on. And then highlight another spot. And this time I'm going to try the healing brush. And you can see it goes to somewhere else in the image and tries to, it uses the tones in that from somewhere else in the image. And if we have a look, yeah, it did a pretty good job. Um, so the remove tool uses a lot of smarts, uh, almost it's got AI built into that remove tool to work out what do they actually want in this spot. The heal tool just goes somewhere else in the image that has similar tones and just brings back similar toned pixels. And the clone tool copies and pastes exactly from somewhere else. So if we go to the clone tool and we click on this spot, it goes to somewhere else and copies it exactly. Can you see how it's copying exactly? And you can move around the source. So if you don't like where it's got the source from, you can move it around to get a better one. But I really do prefer to use something like the heal tool instead or the remove tool. But sometimes you have to use the clone tool because it keeps going to somewhere that isn't really suitable. The sensor spots, um, this image has sensor spots here. It needs to be straightened as well. Um, maybe this one may be allow me to use that those guided transform options. So I'll go down there first. No idea what this is doing. See, these are, this is where the guides are working. You can just tell the image just by clicking on the mouse what you consider to be straight. And it will straighten it for you. And then you can say, constrain the crop and it will constrain the image and straighten the building for you. So it allows you to put up anything up to five guides. You just hold the mouse and draw and it uses the smarts in the background to work out what in the image needs to align with that and be straight. So now we're going to go back up to the heal tool and heal these sensor spots in the sky. Now, Lightroom has this great capability of visualizing spots. So if I click on that, you can see all the sensor spots in the sky that need to be fixed. And it just allows me to go through one at a time I'm on the healing tool at the moment, one at a time and fix those. And you can just click on each one of them in turn. And some of these aren't really visible to the naked eye. It's only when you print or you blow it up that you start to see these spots in the sky. So if you are going to print something, make sure that you get rid of any sensor spots in the back. I think this is telling me I, I need my sensor cleaned because I only took this on Sunday. So we'll go back to um, here, removing distracting elements we just cropped. For the um, this one here, we can use the remove tool. take the visualize spots off and I can just use the remove tool. With any of these tools, it's better off to choose a smaller spot than a big spot because it, if you do it in little chunks, it's a lot easier for it to work out what needs to be done. And I'm just removing bits at a time and it allows the, the smarts in the background to work out Oh, it hasn't worked out very well for that remove tool. So what we might do is try a clone tool instead. 
So I, if you want to delete it, you can just highlight it and hit delete. I actually removed this in Photoshop because Photoshop, if you know how to use Photoshop, it is a lot more accurate with its cloning and healing than uh, Lightroom. So one of the ways that we can do that is just clone it. And it's picked up something else. I can shift what the, uh, the source and just move it around to make it match up. And then it's done. Um, the background for this one, um, it allows us with masking to select the background. And it's very accurate in doing this. It's, it's amazing. See how it's just gone and selected the total background. And I can now make that dark. And it's done. Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, change the clarity of it. to make the background blurry. And then it's a very quick fix and it's turned what was a cluttered portrait into something that actually looks like a portrait. So there are all the sorts of editing tricks that we can have. Um, the spot healing, the clone tool. Uh, next week we'll go in and have a look. Oh, that's the, the um, remove tool that I showed you, but we'll also have a look at more advanced ways of doing content aware fix. When is the best time to fix your content? Before shooting. Before pressing that button, this is where you need to put some discipline in place. Look at your backgrounds. Look around the edge of your frame. Is there anything distracting there? Move the person or the subject. Move yourself. Get higher, get lower. Get them to block out the distracting elements. Change your lens aperture to narrow the depth of field and blur the background. If you've got things that can move, be moved in the image that are distracting, then just go and shift them. It's a lot easier than doing it in Photoshop or, or Lightroom later if there's some at home. So that's the best time to fix. So if you don't actually capture them, then you don't need to fix them. And have a look when um, you are framing up to remove these flaws to go back to some of those compositional aspects that we looked at last year and particularly about edge of frame and distracting elements and get rid of them before you shoot. Now, the last topic that we're going to cover is actual new advancements in fixing photos. And this may only appeal to a few of you that use Photoshop but it will open the eyes to the rest of you of what is actually available out there. So if you've got this amazing photograph that needs a fix that you haven't, um, that you just don't know how to do it, but it's one that you want to put on the wall of the grandchildren, or perhaps it's a uh, heritage photo that you've got of your family and it's got a really big moth-eaten hole in it and you want it fixed because you want to put the photo in a frame, or you want the photo for a book and it's just got this one thing that you need to fix in it, then these are the sorts of tools and techniques that you can use or ask someone else to use them for you. So um, AI is artificial intelligence and it's you've probably heard about it in the press. It's come into photography in a really big way where within seconds you can take something that's very distracting out of an image and fix it. And so the difference between these two photos was probably about two seconds. And we'll have a look at how to do that today. And use it, don't put it in a competition because it's not ethical to put these in competitions. And for many competitions, they actually make it um, invalid or invalidates your submission if you do it. But it is ethical if these are family photos and you just want to remove that distracting element in the background, that bright light that's distracting and, and you really don't know how to go about doing it. So what we're going to do is um, hop into, or we'll have a look at in Photoshop, um, some of the, the quick ways that you can fix in Photoshop. So, I, so this particular photo, um, 
was one that I took last week. And you can't see it until I actually put the crop on it, how close it is to that frame. And these are the times where it's really useful to have some of these tools. But you can see it needs more breathing room there. The photo isn't balanced because it just needs that extra bit of black. Now, what Photoshop gives us the capability to do is expand the frame and then do a generative expand on it. And if I just click generate, it uses all the logic in the image to go, well, what's she most likely looking for? And hopefully <laughs> it will just generate. Oh, well, it's generated a black background. So um, that's now what it looks like. So when I put that there, it's probably, I'll probably bring it in slightly to get it properly balanced. It could probably do with a bit more on this side too. So I could, again, just give it a little bit more on the side. And you can see if I want to put this um, image on the wall, I'm better off with one that looks balanced than one that doesn't. So now that's a much better balanced photo. So this allows you this new generate capability. You can't, it's absolutely seamless. You can't see what it's actually done. So we'll just have a look at some of the other um, images I've got here. This is the one that I showed you online as part of our PowerPoint. And if I just identify where or what I want fixed, so if I say, look, I'd really like this area fixed, I could painstakingly do this using the Band-Aid and Crop tool, and it could probably take me a very long time. Or I'll say, I want that area removed, and I go up to Edit, and say Generative Fill, Generate. And it goes away and uses all the artificial intelligence and logic to come back with what would be a reasonable fill for that. Now, when I select Generate, it only uses pixels that are actually in my photograph. So it doesn't um, use pixels from anywhere else, just my photograph. And it gives me three options. I don't know, probably the first one's good enough. And then I just go back there and you can't tell. It's a, a really quick fix, takes seconds. So we've done that one. This is another one where we can use um, some of the other options other than the AI one. We could try Content Aware Fill. And Content Aware Fill allows us to select what we want to actually go in the image. So before I use content to wear fill, I've actually got to make sure, this is a technical aspect, that I've got to use it on a, a layer that hasn't got a smart object in it. So I'm just going to mark the area that I want added on. And you can see, I, I need this added on because the, the image is unbalanced. So I can just mark up that area, go to Edit, Content Aware Fill, and it comes back and says, what do you want to use to fill that? Can you give me a clue? And I'll say, well, everything, everywhere that's along here, see if you can use that and fill up that border to make it look reasonable. And that, that's the result. You, this isn't using AI. This is sort of a very primitive method of AI. And you can see that you can still see that line along there. I could perhaps have blurred it a bit, but it's, it's certainly not as um, sophisticated as generative fill. So what I'll do now is just put a generative fill on it. And you'll see it's a lot more sophisticated. And this is actually using AI. And 
you can see, it's come back. It, it's decided to put this little bit down here. So I'll see if one of the others is better. Hmm. They've both decided to put something a bit distracting down there, which is easy enough for me to just remove with the clone tool. So I can um, just add another layer to that and then just perhaps even use the Band-Aid tool and just remove that distracting bit down there. And then I've got a much more balanced photo if I want to put it in a frame and, and put it on a wall. So any of you that do know Photoshop, um, or you, if you do want to put an image on a wall and you just go, oh, it's just missing that little bit there on the left or the right, or if it could just get rid of, um, this is a photo that I um, took. I was taking the photo and the people decided to walk through it. And so what I can do with that is just, if I wanted to put this in a photo album of the family, I could just highlight them, go to edit, generative fill, generate, and you'll see what an amazing job it does at getting everything right. I could spend half an hour trying to fix this with a clone tool or a band-aid tool, but the way that AI works now, it's just so quick. Done. So, I wanted to show you about possibilities. One of the other possibilities that we um, have is the capability to generate with prompts. Now, yesterday, uh, as part of our camera club, we have a, a master editor and it's a, a competition. It's not, it's a, it's a load of fun, whereby we get an image and with 20 minutes notice, we have to do something with the image. And this is the image we got yesterday, which you can see it's out of focus, it's too dark, it's got flooded background. I mean, what can you possibly do with this? And so we use all of the AI that we've got at, at hand. So the first thing I did was um, unmask it. And then um, I masked it. And so I've just now got the plane. And then I used a detail extractor to bring up some details. And then I used prompts um, in my generate. So I masked the background and said dark, cloudy sky um, with a dog fight in the background. And that's what I got. So if you put in prompts, AI will go off and get you something. I asked for a pilot in uniform at the controls of the aircraft. And that's what I got. I asked if I could have the Australian Air Force logo. I don't think that's the Australian Air Force logo, but that's what I got. Prior to that, it had that, which apparently is the Australian Air Force logo. I thought it was Qantas. Um, I asked for a Messerschmitt fighter plane. I don't even know if that's a Messerschmitt, but that's what I got. And then I asked for dark stormy sky lit up with explosions. And that's what I got. So within 15 minutes, of seeing the image for the first time, you can create something that is really quite um, acceptable as an image. I mean, it would work fine on front of a, a cartoon book or something. It, it, it allows you to create graphics very, very quickly. The AI capabilities within Photoshop. And I imagine with time, they may start to come into Lightroom. I'm not sure. Um, at the moment, they're virtually trying to keep AI sort of out of Lightroom, but it's still there with masking and things like that. But use your photographs to create art. Um, I, I do. I do book covers for people, and um, there's no holes about what you do with your photographs when you're uh, using them creatively. So, again, I'd ask you for your homework to... Practice, uh, first of all, review all the design concepts that we did last year about how do you identify defects within your images. Uh, practice when you shoot to try and not include defects in your images. Proactively remove them by shifting yourself, shifting the camera, shifting the subject, shifting, changing your zoom and your framing, trying to get rid of them. And try and go as gently as possible on 
fixing those defects. But the other thing is open your mind to using your photographs creatively as art. So thank you. And I hope that helps with some of your um, fixing of your defects so that you can use your photographs, hang them on the wall and put them in albums when you were originally a bit disappointed with them. So thank you. <laughs>